Okay, I'm going to make call this meeting of the Carpentersville Village Board to order. Uh, Kelly, would you call the roll, please? Trustee Burroway? Here. Trustee Stevens? Here. Trustee Humphrey? Trustee Sabi? Here. Trustee Rayberg? Here. Trustee Schultz? Here. President Ritter? Here. Uh, we don't have an invocator here tonight, so we'll just rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> Okay, we have no proclamations, congratulatory resolutions, or awards. No appointments, confirmations, or administrations of oath. Do we have anybody signed up for public comment? No commenters this evening. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, next would be consent agenda. Excuse me. All items listed on the consent agenda will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of those items unless a trustee so requests. In which event the item will be removed from the general order of business and considered in its normal sequence on the agenda. Any items to be removed? If not, I'd need a motion. I'll motion to pass the consent agenda. I'll second. Motion, Paul, second, Pat. Uh, Kelly, would you please call the roll? Trustee Burroway? Yes. Trustee Stevens? Yes. Trustee Humphrey? Yes. Trustee Sabi? Yes. Trustee Rayberg? Yes. Trustee Schultz. Yes. Okay, uh, we're ready for then uh, reports of manager officers, commissions, and staff. Mark, you would be the lead off. I just wanted to let the public know that Lucy Schaefer was contacted by both the HR director and Kelly Nega as the clerk, and she thanked us for the recognition of her Grammy. Uh, and uh, we told her we'd probably put that in the newsletter. Her sister actually does live in the local area that did reach out. And we were going to show, you know, the YouTube video of the songs that she won her double Grammy. But the sound system doesn't work real well, for, so it wouldn't do it much justice. But just wanted to let the trustees know, as well as the public, we will put that connection on the web page so those that were looking for that information and possibly to listen to some of the music that she won her Grammy for would be able to go on it and do a little more justice than how it plays here in our system. But she was appreciative of the recognition. And the name of her first published song was Carpentersville. So that's pretty interesting. <coughs> and then uh, the next report would uh, like to recognize Mark Huber from Community Development, he's got a short update for the public. Good evening, everyone. Um, I wanted to uh, bring this tonight. We're catching up to the finance department with respect to awards, but okay. Bills was awarded this uh, back in December. Um, excellence in public planning, did it three times fast. From uh, King County, uh, the, the planning department, as well as uh, the entire organization of communities uh, in King County that are part of that organization. So we were recognized for the um, Fox River Corridor study that was completed you know, last year and, and, and the board approved at that time. So yeah, we're not sure who nominated us. Nobody ever told us who did the <laughs> nomination, but uh, that was the plan that was done in conjunction with Algonquin and CMAP some time ago, so it's it was recognized <clears throat> primarily for, you know, the usefulness of the plan, multi-jurisdictional plan, and it was a good quality plan that ended up being produced uh, by CMAP. You know, remember we had the public meetings and everything else was associated with that, so just wanted to bring that up. And on the Fox River Valley corridor and the implementation, implementation of the plan, we've been working with uh, King County Council Mayors. Ed, you've probably been working on that for quite some time now, a couple of years, to do some of the signs along of the trail, the wayfinding signs. So we're nearing the completion of that too. Uh, Public Works and Kevin Gray's not here tonight, he's been working with uh, uh, council mayors also. So we'll bring the resolution 
uh, required to uh, implement uh, that plan is basically uh, allowing the village to do the maintenance of those and add some more signs along the way for wayfinding along the path. So uh, that'll be forthcoming somewhere down the road. That's my report. Any questions? No. Great. So could you cover just for Kevin is gone the or Bob? Do you want to, Do you have the material about the uh, ward for Carpenter Creek? Yeah, I don't have that one. And that, but we're just letting the board know that the Carpenter Creek got a recognition for the uniqueness of the plan and the water quality of that EPA implementation and and some of the beauty of the way it was implemented for the flood map. Okay. So he's going to come back from the flood conference, floodplain conference, and next meeting, okay. he'll bring the actual details of that award as well. Okay, yeah, sure. I'll need and, the you details know, that goes with getting the recognition, but it's also that $638,000 the federal <coughs> government gave us to do the million dollar project on Carpenter Creek. Okay. So. Manager Rooney, any information yet on uh, the flood map to take those up? Uh, and those he'll bring an update on where FEMA is on changing the flood map, flood insurance issues for those 40 some properties in that Carpenter Creek region. Mm -hmm. Good. Perfect. Thank Excellent. <clears throat> and that would conclude our reports tonight, Mr. President. Okay. Uh, we have no old business this evening. Under new business, we have an ordinance approving a planned unit development for a new automobile parts and supply store. I would need a motion. A motion. A, a motion. A motion, Ginger. I'll second. Second, Paul. Didn't we, uh, Matt, President Ritter, didn't we skip uh, reports for uh, the various oh, committees? Oh, yes, we did. We keep rolling in there. You, got, we you get, guys got to jump on the island. We'll reports. just do it after yeah. this. Yeah, we'll, okay. we'll just catch up That's with fine. it. I'm okay with it. Space. Sorry. So we have a, did you second, Paul? I did second. Okay, so we have a motion and second. Uh, Mark, you want to fill us I in? I want to just uh, introduce Mr. Huber, representing the Planning and Zoning Commission findings on the store. Uh, thank you, Manager Rooney, Vice President of the Board of Trustees. Um, I believe you've seen in your packet the plans and the ordinance approving the PUD for yes. uh, O'Reilly Auto Parts immediately adjacent to the Walmart parking lot on Lake Marion Road. Um, they met, uh, you know, they came to the plan commission. The plan commission uh, listened to the testimony on that project. Essentially, they're in compliance with all of our zoning standards, uh, but our PUDs are required by village ordinance because of the size of the development. Um, so this ordinance would grant them approval to go ahead and begin construction on that. We're in the process of reviewing their building plans now, but uh, Plan Commission uh, unanimously recommended approval of the project. There are some conditions that are listed in there, and they're pretty much standard for all of them. Uh, yeah. uh, the landscaping and uh, parapets, but those are just our standards, and they've uh, the developers have agreed to meet all those standards. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Anybody? Don? There was a couple of us kicking this around, and I, I assume, uh, because it's not part of the PUD, that they've done all their studies and, and uh, you know, because we're going to have three auto parts stores in a two-block area. Um, so I assume that's all been done, because O'Reilly Parts is a pretty big company, and uh, I, I'm sure they vetted all of that. And They're uh, desirous to be in that location. Um, they, okay. they met all their zoning requirements. Yeah. I don't, I didn't see if it was there. Oh. Yeah. Do you have any, did you want to comment? Does anybody want to ask the developer questions? Or You're the engineer, yeah. correct? I'm the architect. The architect, I'm sorry. Oh, Let's see. Does he have any insight on that question? Yeah, do you have any comments on, um, do you want to step up, please? <coughs> Thanks for coming tonight. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, my name is David Mangerton. I'm a principal in the architectural firm of KMA and Associates, uh, Inc. Architects at 1161 Lake Cook Road in Deerfield. Um, there's a, a process that all, w my client is the builder, and uh, I've been doing his work for 30 years, and we've done four or 500 projects, um, and some for competitors of O'Reilly's, Advance Auto, AutoZone, and those are the neighboring uh, competitors. Um, each of these usually do a due diligence that includes demographics and so on. 
So there's something special about Carpentersville that apparently these people feel mm -hmm. that it can support um, their store. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to hear that said okay. because I, I, I was sure that that had happened, and that they did their due diligence on it. It's just, it just, I don't know, it's just something we were talking about, so I thought I'd ask. No, I, uh, as the architect, I, I, I looked at uh, Google Earth and I was surprised to see the those other uh, uh, businesses also. So uh, I'm, I'm aware of it, they're aware of it, everyone's aware of it. Yeah, I'm sure. Thank and you. The fact that Walmart doesn't have an auto center here makes a big difference too because yeah. they're drawing a lot of traffic but not providing yeah. any competition. So. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Mm -hmm. okay. uh, we also looked, uh, you know, uh, pulled some other communities to see what they do, and you know, right. And it's been pretty typical. Uh, in other yeah. Places we've seen that, and I've seen it in other places myself. You know, where there's a couple of auto parts store within. You know, I was just just checking. Yeah, and yeah. we check too. But <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, kind of like tire tire stores on Randall Road too. There's yeah. quite a few of them right there, three or four. Right. Okay, uh, Pat, go ahead, Berlin I'm sorry. Midas, yeah. No, just to point that uh, because, you know, so there's no misinformation, uh, Walmart owned that property. Right. So they decided who was going to come, not the village. And it's like other properties in the village that were being asked, you know, why don't we do something about. It's owned by somebody else. And so we have to wait until those decisions are made. And then what we do is then we start with the permitting, the zoning, that kind of thing. But when you own that property, it's your decision to make. So, and, uh, so that's, you know, they could have brought in anybody that they wanted to bring in. And, you know, this was their choice. And it could well be, I didn't think about that, Ed, the fact that they don't really have uh, an auto department uh, in Walmart. So yeah, it would maybe be very that's what they, they wanted to do. Yeah. bring in competition for themselves but yeah 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 exactly so but yeah. and we're also fortunate that they didn't decide to put a little professional building or a hair salon or something like that because this is a will be a tax producing building yes as opposed yes. to a non-tax right. producing right. the building. service buildings and they yeah. could have done that as or well, industry so. yeah mm -hmm. best good. choice for us i guess good all right thank you mark anything else thanks mark, mark. no sir that's it okay any other questions or comments from the board if not, uh, Kelly, call the roll. <coughs> Trustee Stevens? Yes. Trustee Humphrey? Yes. Trustee Savvy? Yes. Trustee Rayberg? Yes. Trustee Schultz? Yes. Trustee Burroway? Yes. We should note that Paul came in just after the attendance <laughs> for the audience, so he was <laughs> counted as present at this point. Uh, all right. Uh, well, we'll finish the uh, we'll finish the uh, this part of the meeting, uh, the new business, and then we'll go back and you can make your we'll have our meeting things during uh, trustee reports. All right. At this point, uh, we have a uh, a public hearing to consider the establishment of a special service area number thirty two which is 355 and 350, or excuse me, 365 and 375 Lake Marion Road, also known as Walmart. Oh, okay. uh, I'm gonna open the hearing and ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Trustee Humphrey? Yes. Trustee Savvy? Yes. Trustee Rayberg? Yes. Trustee Schultz? Yes. Trustee Burroway? Yes. Trustee Stevens? Here. Here. Okay. And, um, I declare this uh, public meeting hearing open. The purpose of this public hearing is to dis consider testimony from the public regarding the proposed creation of ser special service area number 32 for Walmart at, 30, at uh, 365 and 375 Lake Marion Road. Special service area is a financing mechanism allowed under Illinois state law to levy a direct property tax to a defined and select group of properties to provide special services. I'll ask our village attorney, Hart Passman, to provide an overview of the proposed special service area to the board and to the public. After the introduction, I will entertain questions from village trustees. After that, I will call on any member of the audience that desires to be heard on this matter. So, Hart. Thank, you. Thank you, President Ritter. Um, this is the uh, second of three required steps, or I should say four required steps, 
for the special service area proposed for the Walmart property. Uh, the board will recall that last month you adopted an ordinance proposing the establishment of this uh, special service area. Uh, that was the first step. State law requires this hearing uh, for which notice has been provided uh, to the uh, affected property owners um, both uh, by mail and uh, by publication. Uh, the purpose of the special service area is for maintenance of stormwater facilities. Um, the new Walmart store um, includes stormwater drainage and detention ponds and management facilities. They require permitting from Kane County to operate those facilities and the county code requires as a condition of issuance of the stormwater permit that there be a special service area established by the village for, um, it's really it's called a backdoor SSA, it's a preventative SSA to have money available in case the property owner does not properly maintain the facilities. That's the purpose of, of, of this SSA, and that's why we're here. Um, under the law, the, um, the village has to hold this public hearing. Uh, following this period, the next step, step three, is the objection period in which property owners and uh, electors within the area, if there are none, could object to the special service area. If there are not a majority of, of each of those categories that object, then the village can adopt an ordinance establishing the SSA at a meeting in about 60 days. So following tonight's hearing, uh, we'll have the objection period. Assuming that there are not sufficient objections, you will have an ordinance placed on your agenda, um, probably your second meeting in May, that would establish this. After that point, uh, documents are filed with the county and recorded, and then the SSA will be established. So I'm happy to answer any questions um, regarding the purpose of the SSA or the legal requirements. I just would point out that every new building, pu public building, has to do this, right? So. When the auto store comes, they will have well, to set no, one up. They're, no, or they're part of <coughs> they're, Walmart. They're part of the Walmart, and the Auto Zone and some of the B Singer property also drains into this um, ah, detention okay. basement. Right. Okay. It, it would have to do. It, it would ha if if a, if a new development has sufficient stormwater facilities, new facilities that require a county permit, right. then no. that's when the SSA okay. kicks in. The last time you did this was a couple years ago for the new Children's Home and Aid uh, mm -hmm. Society right. facility. Yes. Farther down on Lake Marion Road. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And the, like I said, the key is there's no tax levy assessed to the property unless there's a failure on the part of the successor to Walmart and the Beesinger properties that have that stormwater facility. If they fail, then there's a, a mechanism for the village to step in and assess the property to take care of it. Absolutely. That's, that's exactly right. I should have said mine in the form of a question rather than a statement because I'm, I was speaking information actually. Anyone else with questions or comments? If not, I will ask if there are any members of the audience that wish to approach and say anything about this. Seeing none, I guess we can uh, move, have a motion to close the hearing. A motion to close the hearing. I'll second. Motion falls. Second, Kevin. Uh, voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, cl meeting closed. Or Hear hearing, oh, hearing closed. I'm right. Sorry. So we'll be we'll be back. The objection period will start tomorrow, and uh, we will, uh, assuming that the objections aren't met, you'll have an ordinance in about two months. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks. All right. We do have representatives from Commonwealth Edison there, and they, I guess mm -hmm. they should have been under the uh, managers' reports, but. They want to talk to us a little bit about uh, upcoming changes to ComEd. We have a new representative. For years, we had Sylvia, and uh, Sylvia has, has she, I'm not sure, did she retire or did she? She retired. She retired. Okay, so th this is Sylvia's yes. replacement, and let you come on up and introduce yourselves. And then the floor is yours for a while. Hello to everyone. Uh, my name is Ron Banner. I'm an external affairs manager for Commonwealth Edison, and I have replaced Sylvia Rogowski as your main contact. Um, I'd like to introduce our VP of AMI Smart Meter Installation, Mike McMahon, to the to the floor. Thanks, Ron. Um, I'm Mike McMahon. I'm the vice president for uh, Smart Meter Installation for ComEd. Um, here we're going to be in your community shortly, so we thought we'd come out and tell you what you can uh, expect in the near term here. Uh, the smart meter installation, the replacements, was author authorized by the Energy Infrastructure Modernization Act 
in October 2011. That act authorized uh, the Illinois General Assembly authorized ComEd to invest $2.6 billion in its system. About half of that was on infrastructure improvements. About half of that was on smart grid improvements, of which about $1.1 billion was associated with the smart meters. Uh, we started in uh, uh, fall of 2012 installing the meters. We've got about 3 million installed in our service territory. Uh, we're far from the first to do this nationally. Nationally, there's over 60 million meters, smart meters installed right now. And as I said, we're about, we're a little over 3 million right now. So that's about 75% complete. <coughs> uh, we started in the, uh, in the Cook County area, and then we're kind of moving west as we get our installations done. Uh, here, uh, we will be installing uh, smart meters with ComEd resources. We're, we're unique in the country, about 75% of our installers are Comet employees, and they will be working out of uh, our dispatch center, a cross-dock facility. Uh, we call it on uh, Davis Road down in Elgin. So they're going to be very close. They come out, they start about uh, 0620 in the morning, and they come out um, to install from there. I have a map here of uh, the general installation timetable. If I could pass this around, is that okay? Okay. Um, so in Carpentersville, there's about uh, 12,927 meters. We're going to start here in June and then uh, July, a big August, and then we'll finish this off in September, and we should be essentially complete. I'm sure there'll be a few three-phase meters left behind, some of the more complex or unique meters, but uh, generally we're going to be pretty much wrapping it up in, those, uh, in that short time frame. Uh, be before we start installing the meters, uh, you will see a bill insert will come in um, 90 days in advance. Then you'll get a uh, postcard uh, 60 days in advance saying uh, you're going to get a meter. So this is all timed from when the individual resident would get a meter. So 60 days in advance, you get a, a postcard. Uh, 30 days in advance, you get a letter uh, saying we're going to be in your neighborhood in about 30 days to install a smart meter. Please leave your gates open and put your dogs in. Uh, 10 days in advance, you get a robocall saying we're going to be in your neighborhood in the next 10 days. Please leave your dogs in and your gates open. The day of, the meter installer will approach the door. He'll knock on the uh, door. If anybody's home, he'll engage them, answer any questions they may have. If no one's home and he has access to the meter, he'll go ahead and exchange that. Uh, the entire exchange process, the installer is in the yard for maybe 15, 20 minutes. Most of that's computer work. The actual meter exchange is a minute or two, just long enough to pull the old meter out, push the new meter in. Uh, usually, we're able to keep power on in the, uh, in the home. We're able to jumper around that fitting. In apartment buildings where you have banks of meters, uh, they, they like to take advantage of the space. Those usually don't have uh, jumpers, and uh, in older, older homes, uh, they don't have jumpers either. But most of the time, we've been able to keep the power on. Uh, he'll leave a uh, door hanger behind saying, congratulations, you got a smart meter. If you open this up, it'll tell you how to take advantage of the smart meter in some of its programs. 30 days after that, you get another postcard saying, remember, you got a smart meter, and here's how to take advantage of the programs. And 30 days after that, you get one more mailing saying, remember, you got a smart meter. This is how to take advantage of your smart meter for your benefit. Most residences have on the uh, property right now. This is nothing but uh, plastic and metal. It does absolutely nothing except the wheels turn. The meter reader has to come onto your property every single month, or if the meter's inside the house, it has to go in the house to read the meter. This is your uh, smart meter. This will go on virtually uh, every, uh, every home in, um, in every residence in Illinois. Uh, what makes a smart meter smart? Uh, it has a small computer chip in it, two small radios. The computer chip stores the usage information. One of those radios transmits the information to us six times a day. 
total on time for that radio in any 24-hour period is less than five minutes. There's a little myth out there that says they transmit all the time. They do not. Uh, less than five minutes a day. And then there's another radio that <coughs> will transmit information, real-time information, to the homeowner should they choose to enable it. Uh, <clears throat> lots of benefits associated with these. As I said, we're able to uh, collect that information wirelessly now, which means that there will be no need for a meter reader to enter your property anymore. So once this meter is put in and it uh, certifies, uh, that's it. We'll only come out to inspect the meter once every four years. Other than that, we get the interval usage. And that's a real, I, I think that's a real safety feature for both our employees. They don't have to be uh, going to some pretty bad areas in our service territory, and they don't have to be exposed to dogs, always a threat for our meter readers. And that fact that you don't have somebody in your backyard is really resonates, particularly with our seniors. They don't have to worry about who is that person out there, is that guy supposed to be there or not. All our installers, by the way, <coughs> will have a badge. Uh, they'll all be carrying a ComEd badge. We encourage everyone to take a look at that badge, ask to see it. If uh, they cannot produce that badge, close the door, call the police, it is not us. Uh, they'll all be dressed in their ComEd regalia. They'll be driving uh, logoed vehicles. Here's a picture of a typical installer in the vehicle they drive. Uh, we will never ask for money. So if anybody's at the door representing themselves as ComEd, it's not us. Clo definitely close the door and call the police. We will never ask to enter the home unless the meter is in the home. So those three things are what you can expect. We'll have our badge. We're never going to ask for money. We're never going to ask to enter the home unless we have to for the installation process. Uh, the meters are going to help us with outage detection. Uh, they have a feature in them called the last gasp. That meter loses power for any reason. It sends us a signal saying, I'm out of power. We also have the ability to interrogate that meter uh, to say, are you on or are you off? So at the end of big storms, which we haven't had any for quite some time, but at the end of a big storm, when you know, you're really down to the onesie twosies and those restoration processes are like watching paint dry, now we can send a signal to the meters saying, do you have power, do you not have power? Uh, I'm a, a system incident commander, so literally at the end of the storms, we drive streets looking for porch lights to see if those people have power. We don't have to do that anymore. About half our truck rolls are okay on arrival. So we'll dispatch a truck to some place that we think is out of power. We get there, it has power. Now with the pinging, we're able to only send vehicles to places that are out of power. Last year alone, we avoided 50,000 truck rolls to places that didn't need it. Uh, there's a special app as well where uh, if you have our app, you can text in that you uh, believe you have uh, outage, an outage at your home. Now, when you do that with your app, we automatically ping the meter. And it'll say, so the app will say, please wait while we check your power. We'll ping the meter. We'll send you a signal back saying, yeah, we think it's on our side, or we think it's on your side, please go check your meter box or your panel, your service panel box, your breaker box. Last year alone, 30,000 times people did not pursue it after they checked their meter box. 30,000 avoided truck rolls. All that savings gets passed on to you guys every single year. So big, big benefits associated with this. Uh, <clears throat> peak time savings program, want to point that out. As you probably know, electricity rates are set based on the highest, hottest days of the year. <coughs> we'll send, if you sign up for the peak time savings program, We'll send you a uh, text alert or voicemail, however you want it, the day before that hottest day of the year. Say tomorrow will be a peak time day. If you choose to save power, uh, we will give you a, a dollar a kilowatt hour credit over what we calculate you'd otherwise use. It doesn't take that many people to play to lower electricity rates overall. 8%, so 8% of folks actually lower their energy on those few hot days of the year electricity rates can actually come down for everyone, so it's pretty powerful. You save about 4 to $6 an event. We have had people save $33 an event, but I think they gotta turn off their, they gotta throw their whole house off, so 
not suggesting you do that. <coughs> some, some folks have. Uh, you can go online and see your own interval reads and exactly when you're using electricity and how it is. And of course, you can sign up for uh, real-time rates. Uh, you, I think you're on municipal aggregation here. Uh, you get your power not from ComEd, and I would encourage you when you, that comes up, but we're fine, you take your power from whoever you want, but I would encourage you to ask your supplier if they can provide you with what's called dynamic pricing. So the price of electricity, you, you pay, most people pay, and you pay under municipal aggregation the same rate for electricity day or night. It doesn't matter what time of day or night it is, you're going to pay the same price of electricity. Fact is, price of electricity fluctuates hourly throughout the day. And at night, it can be negative. You can actually be paid. Tonight would probably be a good one. You can actually be paid to use electricity because the wind blows at night. And on a, on a cool evening like tonight without much load, there's more elect supply than there is demand. Those prices come down. I'm on real-time rates. I usually pay between 2.3 and 4 cents a kilowatt hour. Four cents on the unusually hot days. That doesn't include the delivery charge. Uh, we do have uh, some people that don't want the meter. Uh, we've got over 3,100,000 meters installed right now. I have about a 0.1% refusal rate. <coughs> Just over 3,000 people have said they do not want the meter. Uh, that uh, is a very low refusal rate, so the vast majority of folks are just fine with this. There's three big reasons why people typically refuse. Uh, one is data privacy. Uh, we do collect that information, your electrical usage information on 30-minute intervals. Some folks think that we will sell that to third parties. Uh, that's probably the easiest one to handle. We will not. There's only three ways we're going to give that up. It's anonymous. You ask us to or it's required by law. Uh, the other is data security. Some folks are afraid it is a wireless device, like your Wi-Fi router or cell phone, any other wireless device that we use everywhere in today's society. Some people are afraid you, know, you can hack into that and get personal information. So one, we employ state-of-the-art cryptographic techniques. Uh, we are able to update our uh, cybersecurity over the air. Uh, we hire people to hack into our system, and if they're able to do that, we plug those holes. But even if, so nobody's going to tell you, I'm certainly not going to tell you anything's hack-proof, right? It, not today. Uh, but even if someone could hack into that, the only thing they're going to get is kilowatt hours and a meter serial number. That's it. There's no personal information in that. That all gets married up in our back office. And then the third reason is uh, radio frequency. As I said, it is a wireless device. Total on time during the day is five minutes. Uh, nevertheless, it is a wireless device, operates at 900 megahertz, same as uh, your garage door opener, or baby monitor, or your phone you use in your house. Some people are convinced that will cause cancer. Uh, while I'm uh, respectful of people's opinions, the science just doesn't support that. If you do choose to refuse a meter, and you can choose, you can refuse a meter for any reason you want, we're indifferent. We're going to ask you. We're going to try to educate you through our education process. We get about 60% of people saying, oh, now I understand. I'll accept the meter. Uh, but if you choose not to, uh, okay, that we're okay with that. You are able to refuse the meter out to uh, 2021. Uh, but there's a fee associated with that of $21.53 a month. Now, you might say, well, what's that fee all about? Well, as I said, it, our new standard is the smart wireless meter. I don't have to employ meter readers anymore. That savings is passed on to our customer base. So the notion is very simple. Uh, should uh, President Ritter have to pay to, for a meter reader to come out and read Mike's meter because I don't want to have a smart meter? And the answer to that is no. Cost causer should bear the cost. And that's where the 2153 comes from. The fee is, uh, doesn't cover the entire cost, covers partial cost to have employ a meter reader to just go out and read that meter for that person every single <coughs> month. And uh, that's a quick tour through it. So any questions? Can you get it to like shock my daughter if she turns every light Par in the house Par on? Me? So can you get it to like shock my daughter if she turns every light in the house on and is not even in there? <laughs> 
<laughs> that would be a smart meter right there. That would, yeah, <laughs> that would be, but no, we would not shock her. Okay. But, uh, but you can buy devices <laughs> that you can place in your home that will alert you through apps of how much uh, devices are on in your house. <laughs> you can do that. Now, we, that's, that second, that's that second radio I was talking about. Okay. That's, that's the way that would work. You can also, uh, the day is coming not too far in the future, where uh, you could also program your appliances to say if the price of electricity is less than three cents a kilowatt hour, turn on. If it's greater than eight cents a kilowatt hour, turn off. Uh, you can also control your thermostat this way. Use a th smart thermostat and you, we can start programming that. And we have several pilots going on with that. It's pretty interesting. You know, you get those reports that say, how are you doing against your neighbors? Uh, you guys get those? Mm -hmm. those uh, we call them O-Power reports. Well, the, I have smart thermostats in my house now. They're, they don't link to the meter, uh, but they're smart thermostats. You can program them. They're called learning thermostats. Before I got those, uh, I was always like bad. You're bad. Uh, ever since I got those, I'm good. So they must be doing something. It's great. You call up, you ask for a ComEd energy audit. You get a discount off of those smart thermostats. And if you get an energy audit in your home, they'll bring those out with them, and they'll install them with no charge for you. It's a great deal. So. And you get all, all kinds of other free stuff, light bulbs and stuff like that. So <coughs> please Pat, call us up, ask for a home energy audit. Pat, did you want to get in? Uh, yes. I, so um, I know they wear the mm -hmm. uniform and the badges, but uh, do you subcontract out your installers? Uh, we do, but not in this area. But not from this area? Not in this area. We, we have about 70. Now, we do have... Uh, we, we will have a couple contractors here. What we saw when we did our pilot back in 2009 is the meter is new. The meter is new. The fitting, the me and it's owned by Comet. The meter is owned by Comet. But the fitting that the meter goes into is owned by the customer and is usually the same age of the building. So we have trained our installers to inspect that fitting when they pull the meter. And if they see it in a degraded condition, then we have uh, licensed union electricians on standby. Uh, they're not comment employees, but they, they're logoed and they carry badges. And we will call them. They'll come out and make repairs to that fitting at no direct charge to the customer. Uh, usually the customer won't, we'll, we'll let them know, but usually it, there's no impact because we've been able to jump her around it. Some cases the repairs are very small. Some cases the repairs can be very big. And then there's a unique type of meter called an A-Base. We have a special vendor that does that. They're called MZI. Once again, they carry a ComEd contractor badge. It's, this is our badge. Theirs is blue. Looks like this. And then they drive vehicles that have a ComEd sign on the side. And when we get to those points, you'll get the call. You can always call in our 800 number, ask, is this guy really here? If they're carrying the ComEd badge, they're driving the vehicle, it would be pretty obvious. We, we haven't had too many problems. So our electricians, our, uh, our contractors, our installers are ComEd employees. So another quick question. Um, so you send out all that uh, information before yep. um, to give folks the option and to let them know that you're being in installing. Um, I did see in your literature here, I kind of Evelyn Wooded it here, that you make an attempt to knock at the door. Yeah. Um, if they do not respond to all of that, the pre-notice, if you will, right. and then they come to your property and you make an attempt, and if nobody lets you in, then do you go ahead and do the installation? If we have access to the meter, yeah. So you would, you would go yeah. on someone's property and install yeah. it is what yeah. I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. All right. What, if we have access to the meter, now if the gate's oh. locked or we can't get to it, in mm -hmm. that case we call that an unable to complete. Mm -hmm. uh, we leave a different door hanger saying that we haven't been able to access your property. Please give us a call, schedule an appointment, mm -hmm. and then we'll follow up with a call as well. Okay. But if we have access to the meter, then yeah, we go just we go ahead and exchange uh, because the meter is our property, so we're just updating our property. Okay. Anything else, Pat? Uh, no. Thank you me. said at one point that we could access the information on our meter. Is that when you were talking about doing that online on your computer? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <coughs> yeah. It's not a separate app or a separate something. You just you just go online and do it. Well, you you sign up for a the program on comed.com, 
and then you go on that program and you can see your interval usage online on the computer in 30 minute increments. So you'll be able to look at and you'll be able to say, oh, this is when I'm really using my electricity. So when the kids come home and turn everything on, you can go, look, you leave those, some of those lights off because they're probably running around turning them all off right when you walk in the door. So <laughs> you can tell when you're using it. I would, I would appreciate that. <laughs> and we've, we've had a few people that uh, have had high usages. We've called them up and informed them, hey, it looks like you can sign up to get what's called high usage alerts. So <clears throat> if you sign up for that, we'll actually send you a message saying, hey, it looks like you're using more electricity than you did this, this time last year. And um, a lot of folks have signed up for that. Uh, usually when they get that alert, it's either one of two things. Oh, yeah. They're either uh, doing some renovations to their home or they just bought a hot tub. It's usually one of those two <laughs> things. Yeah. Kevin, are you going to be able to post this all this information on, on our website? Yeah, I'd like another slide of it too. Well, or Kevin, you want? No, you, you can go. Ahead. Um, could I ask, is there going to be uh, any known, or are there any known benefits to the grid with installing these new meters, making it more efficient, less outages overall? Is is that have any effect on? You know, it? what's really exciting about this is it is it is new technology for us, and so <clears throat> we're developing applications every single day. Uh, and from the grid wise, uh, one of the uh, really exciting things that we're going to be working on over the next several years is called voltage optimization. So you're, you're required by tariff to maintain a certain level of voltage in everybody's house. You used to with the old, old, old tube TVs, you ever see your screen shrink? I don't know if you did or not, but that was because of low voltage. You have to go back a ways for that. That was low voltage. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, in order to make sure that everybody's uh, has the right amount of voltage at the end of the line, we kind of jack it up at the front of the line. Maybe it's higher than what we need. With the analog meters, you can't tell. The smart meters, when we they send us back that information six times a day, they send back other information as well. They send back uh, temperature, how hot am I, and they send back uh, they send back signals for voltage as well. So we're able to use that voltage information to optimize that feeder and it's the definition of efficiency, right? So I'm able to lower that voltage and it brings back the power flows for everybody. There's a lot of data analytics we use during storms. They're, like I said, they're able to ping those meters. So now, rather than having a trouble man go out and stumble around in the dark, looking around for the meters, the dispatchers are able to say, I want you to go between pole eight and pole 42. That's where I want you to look, because I can tell that's where all the outages is. On nested outages, you know, when, when you restore a feeder, the whole feeder, that's the big thing with the three wires coming down the main line, uh, we assume everybody on that line has got their power back. But they don't always. It may be that Mike's house really does have just the line to my house down. And w in the past, we didn't know that. We called that a nested outage. Well, now with pinging meters, I'm able to say that, oh, look, I got everybody else on but Mike. Mike's still out because there really is something wrong with just his house. And then there's other data analytics we can use as well that we're just, we're just figuring out. But yeah, there's, a, there's just a lot of stuff that we're very excited about to be able to use. It's basically a sensor that tells, gives us voltage on, on all these applications. Now with distributed energy, we're also able to use that voltage information <coughs> to tell suppliers who may want to put on a uh, uh, community solar or a battery storage unit, we're able to say this is the spot to put it. This is where it's going to help the best to support the voltage on that entire feeder. So know. there's a lot of specifics we're able to get into. Yeah, I, I think recently, you know, it's gotten better. There has been very few outages. I can remember five, six years ago, yeah. there seemed to be a lot more. I don't know if it has to do with the number of storms that have come through, but uh, uh, well, things seem two to things. Have better. One is the Energy Infrastructure Modernization Act. That passed in 2011. We started investing in 2012. Mm -hmm. We've put over $2 billion into the grid since then. So that has a big impact, but the weather has been favorable. I mean, just look outside, right? The weather has been favorable. Absolutely. But last night, you know, last night, that windstorm we had last night, I will tell you, six years ago, that would have probably been 80, 100,000 customers out last, 
last night a third of that. I was I was waiting for that to happen. It's, it was pretty bad out on the west side. Very windy. Mm -hmm. Winds, some winds on our service territory got up to 70 miles an hour. That yeah. would not have been good six years ago. Today, not so bad. Any Have there been any scams that you've been made aware of locally or taking advantage of the situation? A, a couple early in the program. A couple early in the program, people would knock on the door. They'd say, well, you're going to get a smart meter. You need to give me a $100 deposit. But, you know, that's why, that's why one of the reasons I'm here, we're not asking for money. We got a badge. We're driving a logo vehicle. You got to be careful that you do have to be careful that just because he's in has a hard hat that says ComEd on it, that's not good enough because, you know, the, those are around. They get around, you know. People pick them out of the trash and all kinds of stuff. So that's why it's the badge, and that's why it's the logoed vehicle. That, that that's what we want to that's what we want to count on. But we got on those really fast. So very a, a few early on nipped them in the bud. Good, and I just want to compliment ComEd that finally catching up with the village because we've been using that process of pinging uh, meters to yep. find out what the reading is. Yep. For I think now we do it from telephone poles. We've been doing that for a couple of years at this yep. point. Yeah. And so we don't have to drive around the village anymore to yeah. get That's great. water meter readings. That's great. So, um, good. Couple, couple of things. Number one, and in in you guys may remember this, that ComEd did a lot of work in some of the really uh, tree full areas because this is a pretty old town and we've got a lot of big trees and they did a right. lot of cleaning. And in Lincolnwood, they rerouted the service because the one service went through the swamp. And if they got went out, it was a real challenge to get out there and fix it because it it's a swamp right <laughs> but the other thing is we are not aggregated aggregated means that the whole town has a contract with okay. ComEd okay. for one price and you can either take that price or leave it but okay. we chose not to do that a few years ago so we okay. are not an aggregated town okay. at this point That's well then individually you can call up for real-time rates right <coughs> but yeah it's a default to ComEd but it's not a, a village wide right but, you, but that means you can call up and sign up for real-time rates yeah. as an individual. And they'll, they'll do an assessment to tell you whether or not you're a good uh, customer for it. Uh, look, if, you, if you're the guy that's not home during the day, uh, this is the program for you. you know, so. Anybody else with a question or comment? I have. Oh, Kevin, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. Looked the wrong way. You mentioned that there are three ways that you give up uh, residence data. One yep. is if they ask for it. Two is if you're legally required to give it up. And then the third way is in aggregate. Anonymous. Anonymously. Could you elaborate a little more on how you, uh, I'm assuming you sell it to third parties? Well, it's it's not so much, we don't really sell it, but uh, we give it away for research, researchers. So the anonymous data is uh, used where you, you strip out the addresses, strip out all the personal information, and you just say these 5,000 square foot houses use this much and it's in this general area. You average it over no less than eight. I think it's eight. So it's not individual. It has to be in a bundle of eight. So you can't get to who whose individual residence it is. But uh, people do need that. And they primarily need that in order to develop the dynamic racing, uh, dynamic pricing plans I was describing before where they'll say between noon and 12, uh, noon and 5 a.m., uh, I'm going to charge you, if you, I'll charge you this much electricity. Between 5 a.m. and 10, 10 a.m., I'll charge you this much. You know, Texas is way ahead of this. They, Texas has uh, lots of different electricity rate plans. Uh, they have, like, uh, free electricity on weekends. Remember when you always waited till 5 o'clock on Friday to call mom? Uh, well, same thing with electricity because electricity on the weekends is abundant. <coughs> so, you know, the, you can develop different rate plans. It's called time of use, where they do block times during the day. ComEd offers uh, real-time rates, where the rate changes every single hour, and that's primarily what we want to use it for. And we encourage all those suppliers to be able to offer those different rate plans, give customers different choices. So, you're, so you're, you're providing that information to researchers who are using it then to sort of turn or suppliers or yeah. suppliers is it a is it a revenue stream for you or is this no. something that's given like yeah. quid pro quo so that you get something back out of it some data not really something? no okay not really it's all it's all in the law it's all kind of regulated i i don't i'm not aware if we get anything 
act for it or not except for a good working relationship. And it, if we did, if we did get anything back on it, that would be a deduct from a revenue requirement and you guys would benefit from it. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Okay, very thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. No, that's okay, then uh, we'll go on what? first to uh, no, committee I reports. Wouldn't. Pat, any committee report this uh, evening? No, uh, nothing tonight, uh, President Ritter. Our next uh, um, Parks Commission special events meeting, um, and I, I don't know if Bob can help me out. I think it's the 22nd. I'm sorry, I don't have my calendar in front of is me. It? We haven't had the agenda sent out yet, I so believe I believe it's the 22nd of Wednesday, and we meet in Public Works at 6.30. So, thank you. Kevin? Uh, we had an Audit and Finance Commission meeting on February 28th at 6.30. Uh, it was a very productive meeting. I think it went about uh, three hours long. We covered uh, quite a few topics. Uh, I'll just do a, a quick rundown of, of what was covered here. Uh, we uh, approved the resolution adopting our meeting schedule for the year. Uh, as it turns out, our next meeting is April 11th. That'll be at 6.30 uh, at the, at the uh, Public Works facility, the same place that, that they're always at. Uh, we also covered uh, our pension uh, responsibilities. Uh, Chief Kilborn gave a very enlightening presentation on the, the 2015 biennial report. A couple, couple things worth noting. I'll just note a couple of the trends here. Uh, percent funded is always a very uh, concerning uh, metric for every municipality, any, anyone who's in charge of pensions because you want to make sure that there's enough money in there to pay everyone out accordingly. Uh, on the police pension fund side, and I'll give this sort of as a, as a trend here, uh, in 2005, the uh, pension fund was, was funded at 51%. Uh, as of 2014, the police fund is uh, funded at 54%. So from 51% to 54%, uh, pretty much baseline there. The uh, firefighter pension fund uh, in 2005 was funded at 73%. It is now funded at 71%. Uh, and the reason given for that is that the, the, this is a newer fund, uh, so there aren't as many uh, retirees drawing out of the fund. So that's why uh, it's, it's at 71% uh, as opposed to the 54% the, uh, uh, that, uh, that the police fund is at. Uh, also commend our uh, pension board for uh, their rate of return. Uh, we were given some uh, comparisons on their rate of return compared to other pension funds, and I believe they were in the um, top 10%, I believe, uh, for a rate of return. Police 10%, fire, I believe 20%. Yeah, so top, is top 10 percent for police and top 20% for fire. And that is a, a, a crucial, crucial measurement because when those investments come up short, it's the taxpayers who have to uh, fill in the gap there. So th that rate of return is crucial to uh, some level of, of property tax relief here. So uh, I commend the, the uh, pension boards. Great job there. Uh, we also discussed uh, crit uh, critical incident team funding. Uh, this is a training program uh, for our police force and it, it uh, enables them to learn how to handle uh, what might appear to be a life-threatening situation to the officer, but it really isn't. It's, it's uh, maybe a resident with autism or something that, uh, uh, you know, some type of developmental disability, and it, it trains the officers in, in the ability to discern uh, that situation and diffuse the situation uh, so that uh, someone isn't needlessly hurt, so that the village isn't needlessly put into a, a risk category. Uh, it, it's, it's a win all around, and it's a, it's a very in-demand program around the state. Uh, it's almost, uh, the chief compared it to uh, Pearl, Pearl Jam tickets. You, you have to get, get online early and, and really hammer on that submit button to make sure that you get uh, your resources allocated to it. So uh, we're going to be putting some funding towards that in the future, so we, d we discussed that quite a bit. It seems like it's an excellent program. Uh, director, or not, not director yet, uh, Kevin Gray, uh, provided a, a rundown of capital uh, projects in the village, a, a very detailed rundown. Uh, I'd like to get that on the website if it isn't, isn't already. That is, it was very uh, detailed. We, we've already had that rundown sort of here at the village level multiple times, but it's still uh, nice to have that refresher. So I'd like to get that out there as well. Uh, we also discussed uh, water and sewer rates, as, as we always do, and uh, we'll also be 
sending out our uh, garbage or our refuse contract, we're going to be sending that out. We're going to be uh, doing RFP for that or, or RFQ, uh, uh, requesting multiple bids for that so that we can see, uh, you know, comparison shop and see where, where we land there and get the best uh, get the best value there. So uh, we might be switching garbage carriers in the future. We don't know. We're going to see where uh, where the where the uh, bids land. Uh, finally, we went through our. Uh, fiscal year 2016 unaudited financial numbers and discussed uh, our alternatives with, with what we can do uh, with the with the funds there. Uh, that was some spirited discussion there as well. So it, it uh, a very productive meeting. Uh, had a few things carry over to April 11th, like that final item there. Uh, and and in our other items, we also discussed a newsletter and we kind of we went through what was being covered there and, and what fantastic reach that is for the village. <coughs> to have that distributed out. So that was covered there as well. Uh, and that concludes my report. President Ritter, yep. I need to make a correction. Uh, Jeff uh, looked on his calendar. Our meeting is next week, Wednesday the 15th. The 15th. I'm sorry, I did 15th. say the 22nd, it's the 15th. So thank you. Paul? Uh, <clears throat> we'll have a uh, business development commission meeting at the end of this month, uh, three weeks from today on the 28th of uh, March. So they'll start at uh, five o'clock. Um, and anyone will have it on the second floor of the uh, village hall, and anyone's invited to attend. Uh, Quadcom, we had a meeting on the 22nd of February. Uh, we discussed the budget that's that's coming up, uh, the 2017-18 budget. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't make a recommendation on that because we did not have a quorum. So uh, we rescheduled the a meeting for uh, the 22nd of March. So I'll have further data then for you. And since we're at you, this trustee report time, so we'll just let you go ahead with your trustee report. Uh, oh, well, uh, <clears throat> just a, a shout out. I guess I could have said commission, but we're going to have uh, Thursday, we'll have the C4 meeting, which is Carpentersville Community Coalition CARES. It's a substance abuse prevention and overdose awareness. Uh, that will be at 7 o'clock at Public Works. I invite all residents to attend, all the board. Uh, chief will be there. I'll be there. And uh, this is in coalition with... Uh, uh, the Wren Center and Addiction Center in Elgin, and uh, with uh, Jason Too Soon, which is a uh, overdose awareness group, and uh, it's something we have to look into. We're starting to gather gather a lot of data, and some of this data that you get from the schools and stuff is pretty scary. But every parent should be aware of this. Every parent. Uh, that's all I got. Thank you. Pat? I just wanted to mention um, that I thought the Audit and Finance Committee meeting was uh, very good. It was a really great report that you gave, Mike, um, and uh, it w a lot of great topics, you know, more to be discussed, and um, was nice to have uh, civil discourse and factual discourse um, there in order to be able to uh, make those decisions. So. I, uh, like Paul always says, and Kevin, invite anybody to come to those open meetings and uh, so that you can see the presentations, see the numbers, and, um, you know, again, uh, so have the facts in front of you. So it was a great meeting. Thank you. Kevin? No trustee report for me tonight. Thank you. Jeff? I just want to remind everybody we have the League of Women Voters candidate forum here, right here, right, tomorrow, tomorrow night. So... Uh, come out and if you have any questions for the prospective trustees and prospective uh, village presidents it's uh, it's a great forum and bring your kids let them learn something it's seven o'clock correct seven o'clock yes mm -hmm. uh, good audit and finance commission meeting kevin uh i'm disappointed how poorly attended those meetings are so a lot of good information that's shared uh the discussion on the levies i thought was uh, crucial for this time of the year um and we continue to um, you know, provide most of the increases to our pension funds. And um, that three-legged stool that uh, uh, Chief Kilburn talks about, residents, 
the uh, firemen or the policemen and then the investments uh, there it's important and uh, while the amount of the value of that fund that we have invested in it has to be at 100 percent by 2040 um, we're moving in the right direction and uh, closing that gap so that we're not kicking the can down the road and having to come to a back big tax increase for our residents so um, I hope that continues I think it's important um, and you know we're following what has been provided to us or passed by law by Springfield so uh, very important you know, by, uh, by comparison, I believe Chief Kilborn mentioned that uh, Fox River Grove was 5% funded for one of their pensions, you know, or 51 and 70, 71 or something like that. So, you know, it, there's, there's plenty of trouble out there. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I mean, if you don't do it, if you do kick the can down the road, they'll force you to um, restrict your fund balance, mm -hmm. which will limit your ability to do projects in town. Right. Um, infrastructure project, um, you know, just about uh, debt service, things like that. We'll all be affected by that. So um, it's important and, um, you know, the numbers don't lie. They show that continual uh, increase in pension costs here in the village and that's where the majority of the tax increases are coming from. So, but uh, good, good meeting, you're doing a great job. Really appreciate it, thank you. Thank you. And um, I agree, I was at the audit and finance uh, meeting as well, and it was uh, very informative. Mike had a great presentation. Um, agree, we all had a great discussion. Um, and it's too bad there, there's not a lot of other people that come to get that, that information so they can get the facts straight and really see what the budget's about. But uh, it was a good thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a very informative process. At, it is. At every meeting, we, we try to structure that way. That concludes my report. That, along the same, but meetings are generally take about two hours. That tells you how much we discuss the <coughs> things that are going on and where the money's going to go, what money's coming in, uh, all those kinds of things. Revenue estimates come through there. Uh, but, you know, when we start putting the budget together and September or November? November, right? No. October. 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 Uh, we'll probably have 10 to 12 hours of meetings uh, through audit and finance to go over all the ins and outs of the budget. Oh, let's see. Uh, a couple things. I, uh, I had a meeting in, in West Dundee along with uh, uh, Mark Huber with uh, our counterparts. Uh, we try to meet with West Dundee once a month because we have so many things going on together. Uh, we're working together on Spring Hill Mall updates and projects. We have two big road projects that are gonna start someplace in the fall or spring of, the, of this coming year, the project that Carpentersville is, we're basically the money source, not source, but we uh, do the funding and so forth on the project that goes from Lincoln Avenue to Elm, and then West Dundee does the part of the project that goes from Elm to Sleepy Hollow, which as most of you probably, by now probably know, that means that Sleepy Hollow is going to be four-laned all the way out to, uh, it's not Sleepy Hollow, Huntley Road will be four-laned all the way to Sleepy Hollow. All the bad spots are going to be done. We, we had thought about maybe having to do an emergency repair on our section of Sleepy Hollow or Huntley because it's, it's getting pretty rough, but to spend $100,000 and then go back out and tear it out six or eight months later to put a new road in made no sense financially. So unfortunately, our part of uh, Huntley Road is getting a little bumpy, but it's a decision we had to make. We, the, you know, we can't spend $100,000 and then tear it out. The people would really love that idea. Uh, if we spent a hundred thousand like that, um, audit and finance. I guess we've said enough about that. Uh, the the village is also a member of a Northern Kane Chamber of Commerce, and as such, it was our turn to hold what's called Rise and Shine. It's where all the business people get together at about eight o'clock in the morning and just have a general discussion about what's going on and business wise in in Northern Kane County and you know, have bagels and orange juice or something like that. It was our turn to host this time, so that was a 
two weeks ago on a Friday. Very nice. We've got a lot of nice merchants in town, and it's always enjoyable to sit down and talk with them. Uh, that would conclude my remarks for today. The next thing would be the need for a closed session uh, for sections 2C1, 2C5, and 2C11 of the Open Meetings Act. I would need a motion to go to closed session. A motion. Motion, Ginger. Second. Second, Jeff. Uh, call the roll, please, Kelly. Trustee Savvy. Yes. Trustee Rayberg. Yes. Trustee Schultz. Yes. Trustee Burroway. Yes. Trustee Stevens. Yes. Trustee Humphrey. Yes.